Perfect. Thank you. Um, this presentation outlines uh, various discussions CJ and I and a couple of other colleagues have had about how to enable support for synchronous operation in hi hat. Um, and the outline of the presentation is that we'll first I'll first talk about a bit of the background, um, summarize the requirements for the, for enabling the synchronous operation support in the hi hat. Uh, state some assumptions or you know truths. Um, then draw a sketch of how how I how we think it could be implemented, designed, and we we can you know uh, have some questions afterwards. But please please stop me at any time with, with questions. Uh, I don't mind at all. <clears throat> um, so <laughs> there is a, a bit of a uh, mismatch between where the architecture of hi-hat stands and what the application, what, what the implementation supports uh, as of now. So architecturally, hi-hat uh, always had the notion of everything that it does, everything and any task that is submitted uh, through a hi-hat is asynchronous. The implementation, however, did not support that, and. We want to flesh it out in, in a bit more detail and and propose uh, how to do that. So the different actions, different tasks you could have pertain to the invocation of of uh, compute, uh, data management, data movement. Uh, you could have some synchronization operations and things like that. Uh, the architecture provisioned for the synchrony through the notion of action handles, uh, which are opaque data structures that hi -Hat exposes, uh, which capture the state of a given of a given action of a given task. Um, you could think, for example, on the just the, the level of the uh, action handle uh, as, as a very uh, simple way to synchronize between different tasks. You could just say that uh, each of the tasks submitted to a given execution resource would be would be serialized, and you know a FIFO dependency would be enforced. Uh, you could also supply, in, for example, an invoke or an HUG copy. You could also uh, supply an input dependency that was for now ignored by the implementation, but in general, it it allows for uh, specifying the dependencies between different actions in a hi hat. Um, the documentation or the description of the architecture never uh, went into describing what is the underlying implementation of of an action handle and what synchronization object uh, you know supports that which which are synchronization object backs. The, the action handle. Um, it didn't describe the uh, the interactions with with the synchronization object uh, and interfaces, and we want to go into that that uh, level of detail in this presentation. Uh, thinking about the requirements, uh, we have summarized them into six requirements. Uh, for which are related to the action handles and how you can interact with them directly. And there are two more detailed ones which specifically concern the synchronization objects. Uh, um, so the first requirement, uh, A1 here, uh, is something that I mentioned just now, is the possibility to specify an input dependency to any action you submit through a hi-hat. And that idea, that notion was already present in the hi-hat API. So you will notice there is an input dependency, input depth argument in any of HHU invoke, HHU copy, HHU regmem, anything like that. So that's already covered, but I wanted to spell it out. Uh, the second one is uh, the possibility to combine multiple action handles through logical operations. Say, in, in the most basic case, 
I think you only need and an or uh, to to uh, cover most of the cases, so that you can have an action handle that is triggered, uh, that is considered to be completed when all of its input dependencies are are met, or uh, you can have an action handle that is triggered once one or more of its input dependencies triggers. So this is the idea of creating a logical and, and an or uh, of multiple action handles. Um, the APIs to do that already existed. Uh, there is some discussion on how that should be done, but we'll get to that. Um, the third one is rather straightforward, the ability to query the status of an action via the action handle. Um, and the fourth one is the domain uh, you know the meat of this conversation, uh, the, the synchronization objects, how to expose them, and how to operate on them. And the two extra requirements uh, concern specifically uh, the interoperability uh, on synchronization objects, the ability for I had clients and implementations plugged in from beneath to operate on synchronization objects. Uh, without high hat involved hat involvement and allowing them to do so efficiently right <clears throat> to outline the the design of the of the feature the overall design um, the client above high hat only owns the action handle um, which is an opaque pointer to uh, an internal implementation that is owned by hi-hat. So hi-hat creates the implementation, basically the data structure that um, the, the opaque handle points to at the time of the creation of the of the task. So when you do an HQ invoke or a HQ copy, this is when hi-hat would create that action handle, be it you know, allocate or get it from a pool or anything like that. Um, the action handles themselves, the, the implementations, uh, they're destroyed uh, with, a, for example, a clean. Uh, and yes, the, 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 the idea of uh, cleaning up the, the internals of an action handle We'll talk about it once uh, once we go into the discussion of synchronization objects. Um, and the implementations that are plugged into Hi-Hat from below are the actual underlying synchronization object, uh, which Hi-Hat points to from inside its own implementation. Um, but the, the actual synchronization object is owned for by by the implementation and hi hat will ask the implementation to for example destroy the synchronization object when it when it's done once it's done with a particular action handle but it's always the responsibility of the implementation to destroy the uh, the synchronization object properly and that's just basically putting the the previous slide into a picture to uh, maybe delineate the, the boundaries a, a bit more clearly. Uh, so on the left, in the dark green, you have an action handle, the opaque handle that is uh, owned by the client, by the user, which points to an internal implementation uh, in Hi-Hat, which is owned by, by Hi-Hat. And part of the in internal implementation is an opaque handle that is meaningful to the implementation. Uh, for example, it could be a could event, or it could be um, a pointer to a more complex data structure. Right. Uh, diving into what the proposal looks like, um, the first requirement that was that's the one that was already covered. Uh, all of the APIs that create actions, that create tasks, have an input dependency uh, argument, and they have an output handle, which can be used as an input dependency for different tasks. They have that argument as well. 
Uh, you will note that there is only one input dependency uh, that is supplied uh, to the action. It doesn't allow, uh, for example, multiple action handles to be passed as input dependencies to, to the task. And that is because uh, there are specific APIs to, for combining uh, multiple action handles with, with logical operations. And those, those APIs uh, exist already. Um, so for example, HH using all will take an HH action handle set of input dependencies. Uh, and at some point in the future, how the action handle will be marked completed once uh, all the input dependencies are marked completed. Uh, conversely, HH using any uh, takes an input dependency, input depth uh, action handle set, and its own out action handle will be triggered once one or more of the input dependencies trigger. And it also has this additional argument for passing out the uh, the triggered uh, triggered uh, action handle set. So if you have one action handle that triggered, this set will only contain one action handle. If you have more, it would contain more of those, uh, basically. Um, okay, I, I seem to be going pretty fast through the slides, so please, please stop me if anything is not clear. Um, the third requirement, querying the status of an action handle. Uh, the first API that is on the slide, I probably should have marked it in some way, is something that would have to be added. There is no simple API to get the state of an action handle, uh, but it seems rather straightforward to add one, and its signature is rather simple. You only accept one action handle, and you return the state that the action is in. Uh, there are two existing APIs uh, which are also uh, blocking uh, in the sense that they don't submit any new tasks. Uh, so it is the sync all and sync any, similar to the previous slide. Uh, but the HN sync all uh, just blocks until all the actions in the action handle set are marked as completed, activated blocks. And the sync any follows the similar uh, you know, pattern of behavior as the, the API in the previous slide. And it also returns the, the, the action handle set of what has triggered uh, already by the time it returns. And the, uh, the fourth requirement is uh, operating, obtaining and operating on the synchronization object, which uh, which is used by the action handle. So um, the action handle implementation it has a pointer. To, to the synchronization object that is owned by the implementation. Uh, and this, the value of this pointer basically can be retrieved through with the HH, any action get handle get post dominating sync object API, uh, which takes an action handle and returns the synchronization object itself and the, the, the description of the synchronization object. And I will go into how, what the synchronization object is and how it is described in a second. Uh, one thing that is important to note here is that it is valid for an action handle to not have a synchronization object to it at a given point in time. Uh, so this API can either block until the synchronization object has been set by the implementation or it can just fail 
if the synchronization object is not not available. Uh, so to put it into perspective, uh, we do not necessarily require the implementation to fill in the uh, synchronization object when it when it when it's implementation for invoke or copy or whatever finishes. So there is no such requirement. They're free to fill it out later. Uh, if that would be a more performant path. Hey Wojtek, maybe uh, you, you said it, um, but maybe just for people who haven't thought about this so much, you want to re-review for a second in light of that particular topic, either now or at the end, sort of the relationship between uh, action handles and synchronization objects and uh, what it is that we're trying to do with asynchrony. I think you're going to come back to that, right? Right. Um, I'll probably, I'll, I would first go into the how, the how you interact with the synchronization object themselves, and then we can probably return to that. So that it, we have more more background. So, so just ahead, uh, others. There, there may be more context of this coming, and uh, this is kind of an important point that we'll come back and talk to. Right. Thanks, CJ. Uh, and there is a, a, a corresponding API for setting the synchronization object that we expect. You know, the implementation will use to fill the, synchro the synchronization, to assign a synchronization object to an action handle. And that takes us into the description of the synchronization object itself. Uh, so as you can see in the bottom left corner, the synchronization object handle is just, uh, you know, a void star. Uh, we don't, hi-hat doesn't care what really is underneath that. And the description structure on the in the top left, um, there is a there is a type index uh, that describes what type uh, the synchronization object is of. Uh, there is the total size of the synchronization object if somebody has to copy it somewhere, um, and there is an enumerated kind uh, which describes the semantics for uh, when the synchronization object is considered to be triggered uh, or not. And in the top right corner, you can see uh, the values in the enumeration. So uh, the first one is not described in the case when you cannot describe your synchronization object with memory uh, value semantics. So for example, your synchronization object is something completely opaque that you want, do not want to expose, but you only want to provide um, uh, a procedural interface to. Uh, this is what you would use. And there are things like, you know, equal greater or equal greater than, things like that. And um, there are values in the uh, description structure on the left. Uh, which correspond to the values that you would be comparing against. So, for example, if you want to test if if the value of the synchronization object indicates that it is triggered, uh, you would take you would cast the the void star that is under the ob synchronization object handle. You would cast it to appropriate sized integer and compare it against. Um, the triggered value from the from the synchronization object description, um, and there are three of those. There's a triggered value for the for the trigger state. There is the untriggered value for the properly initialized but not triggered yet state, and there's the uninit value for the rare case when your synchronization object is is created but is not ready to use yet. Uh, and oh, I skipped two fields. So the state field offset and the state field bytes are, you know, the offset and the size uh, that you, the offset, how, how much uh, you should offset yourself from the void star that the synchronization object handle is to read the, the value and the bytes uh, field de defines how much uh, data you have to read you know, be it one byte, two bytes, 
three, four, you know, up to eight bytes. Uh, for comparison against the triggers val, on triggers val, or an init val. And finally, there are two function pointers uh, in the description structure. Uh, first, there is the query think object state function, uh, which is a, a function pointer that you would uh, call if you wanted to um, query the state of the synchronization object. And that goes back to when I what I was saying about the synchronization object not being describable through memory uh, value semantics. This is, you know, if, if, it, if it cannot be described through memory uh, value, you would supply a function, a callback that somebody would have to call to verify the state of the synchronization object. And there is also a, a function pointer for destroying the synchronization, the synchronization object uh, itself that will be used by, for example, hi-hat when it decides to delete the action handle and then free the corresponding synchronization synchronization object. Uh, it was quite dense, but I think I covered everything, uh, but uh, we'll surely come back to it uh, in the discussion. Oh, I had some nice animations that I forgot about. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention here is that um, the separation of the object handle and the object description comes from the idea that you can have the same description for multiple synchronization objects. So if you have if your implementation has a particular synchronization object that you want to use, you would create multiple synchronization objects, but you only need one, you know, description data structure really that you can just pass around in all of the API calls so that you don't have to allocate it uh, many times. Now that we have the description of what the, well, now that we have the definition of what the description of the synchronization object looks like, uh, we can now uh, talk about the uh, two additional requirements for interoperability uh, on synchronization objects. Um, the main one, one of the cases is that you have two implementations which both understand the same synchronization uh, objects or synchronization primitives. So, for example, you could have uh, a publicly available case of this is, for example, um, EGL and uh, and CUDA, and there is an interoperable uh, there is interoperability uh, between the EGL synchron synchronization objects and CUDA events. Uh, and I have a sample of that uh, later in the in the sample session. Um, but we want we want to allow the implementations, different implementations, to realize that either somebody is using their you know uh, native uh, uh, synchronization object type, or that they can understand or interpret or convert or uh, do something else with the with the synchronization object that was passed as part of the input dependencies to whatever they have to do. Um, to allow that, there is this field called type index uh, in the synchronization object description that conveys the uh, uh, the the well the type of the synchronization object, and that type index. Um, you could expect, well, it's an enumerated value. Um, it's an integer, and uh, how clients and implementations come up with that integer is not really, uh, it, it's, it's up to them, really. But um, because we have to have multiple parties agree on the, you know, the same values to describe, for example, you know, a current event or an EGL, uh, think. Um, we propose that hi-hat shapes a header file uh, that enumerates, you know, some 
probably not all possible synchronization object types and their corresponding description structures. Um, the the header will not be used by hi hat, so hi hat will not internally, you know, use any knowledge coming from that. Uh, and the type will be enumerated, and it will not will be enumerated by you know C enum, but it will not be registered with hi hat per se. So that is a bit of a break from the the standard uh, hi hat approach to registering. Um, you know, implementations or everything else. Uh, the type just exists. Uh, I had, does not really care how that index, how that integer comes to be. Um, and we propose that it comes from enumeration in an external header file that will be shipped with, with hi hat. And I hope I have, yes, I have the, the you know, the sketch of the header and the implementation behind it. Uh, here, so in the header you have on the left uh, the uh, the enumeration. So, for example, you have the HHH, which stands for Hi Hat Helper, uh, Create Event, EGL Sync, KHR, uh, File Descriptor, some you know anything else that you can imagine of, you, know, you can imagine, and uh, you have pointers to the description of the. Uh, of the synchronization object. And on the right, you have a CPP file uh, that would define the descriptions for the synchronization object types that are enumerated in the header on the left. So that file would, uh, would uh, define a function for, for example, querying the CUDA event and a function for freeing a CUDA event, and then it would uh, define a structure um, that that contains the description of, of a CUDA event. So you can see, for example, that CUDA event has type index um, zero, it has the size of, you know, size of CUDA event, it is not described, so the, all the values to be compared against are, are zero, the offset and the size are zero as well. And you have the two functions uh, saved in the structure as function pointers. And maybe to clarify all this, we'll walk through some sample code that we came up with. Um, so the easiest one, client code just simply Accessing the action handle and querying it for its state. So you can uh, imagine the client code doing an HHU invoke, getting an action handle back, and then just, for example, looping, um, checking for the state of the, the action handle to be anything else than pending. Uh, a more complex example of client code where the client code understands uh, a CUDA event and wants to do something special with it uh, is that when it does the HTTP invoke, it gets the post-dominating sync object on that. And I'm sorry, I forgot to update the slide to include the Boolean value here. Uh, it then checks uh, check the type index whether that equals HHH could event T and if so it just calls could event synchronize and if it's not it just defaults to querying hi hat's API in a loop uh, like we like we see, saw in the in the previous slide. Uh, the more useful example is um, in case for example of a could event T that is used by implementation. So say you plug in an implementation to a hat from below and your implementation actually you know, does some CUDA stuff and somebody passes you an input, hand, input dependency. In, in general, you wouldn't know what the, input, what the type of the input dependency is, but here you just get the sync object of that input dependency. And again, here I forgot to update the slide. 
and uh, you check if it's a good event, and if it is, well, lucky you, you can just put, put that dependency into the CUDA runtime and not worry about managing the dependency yourself. Uh, otherwise, you have to uh, you know, note it somewhere that before you get to execute this task, you have to actively block and wait on, on input dependency. And you know, uh, building on top of that example, uh, let's see an example of an interoperability between CUDA event and EGL. Um, so the rest of the code that is not highlighted is the same, uh, but what I added is that, for example, you check that uh, the, the type of the input dependency synchronization object is EGL sync. And then there is a public CUDA API that you can use to convert a EGL sync or you, to create a CUDA event that is equivalent to EGL sync. Internally, I think what it does, it just chains the, the uh, CUDA event after the EGL sync. But the semantics is that you get a CUDA event that will trigger as soon as the EGL sync uh, triggers. So you get a CUDA event from an EGL sync. And then you just use that as if, as if it, as you would uh, use it if the input dependency was just good event. So that allows for a nice interoperability between uh, different uh, di different implementations, which is different uh, event types, but the event uh, the synchronization object sorry, but the synchronization objects are are interoperable. Well, and finally, uh, the, the memory description interface. Um, so you get a synchron the, the synchronization object of your input dependency. Uh, you see that it's something that, that, is, that is described by memory value semantics. Uh, you can check in debug mode that everything uh, matches. And then, for example, you can just actively spin in your implementation, which is probably not the most efficient thing to do. Uh, but you can actually enqueue the, the waiting for the value or reading, reading the value, waiting for it to, to reach a specific value, um, and do it in, on the device, if the device you know, allows uh, reads from that specific memory location. And this is how you would use the, the memory the description interface. And that, well, that I just blasted through all the slides. Um, so I'm happy to take questions or go back to the issue that, that CJ pointed out. Well, I think a uh, high-level comment is that the examples that we gave here came out of some work we've done looking at this in a CUDA context and looking at how we might make that uh, interoperable for something like our Tegra SOC, where we have different kinds of engines which have different software stacks. So that was just sort of a useful vehicle for making this a very practical and pragmatic and uh, tangible um, implementation example to look at that. Um, we'd be happy to have others contribute examples for other targets and uh, so on as well. Looks a little quiet here today. Other questions? Do you want to, yeah, uh, Boitek, do you want to kind of highlight some places where you may especially want to get some feedback or offer some discussion? Right. Um, so let, let's go back to the point uh, where you, you highlighted this was the main. Uh, area for 
questions. Um, the question is about the ability for an action handle to not be backed by an actual synchronization object uh, you know, until the implementation decides to, to, to provide a synchronization object for it. Um, this design is quite general and allows many use cases. Uh, we're, we were brainstorming a bit about how to, um, what good would be, what come out of it and what would, what would the ultimate use case for that be. Um, but I, I was hoping for, uh, some thoughts on how it would be useful for us, for an implementation to supply a synchronization object uh, later down the road rather than upfront by the time its uh, its implementation is is invoked. Do you want to try to add some color to that? Um, how about can, can you you know maybe comment on that and expand the question? Sure. So I I think that um, maybe just a couple of highlights. The if you look at some of the design and overall performance objectives of this, uh, we really really want to be general. So that uh, you can have synchronization happen in a variety of different ways for any kind of platform, whether that happens in hardware, in some register, whether it happens in memory, whether, uh, and if, if those things, you can directly access it and completely bypass hi-hat you know, and uh, make it work for a legacy code. So those are important. Um, and if you wish, uh, you can also do um, use a programmatic programmatic interface, and with the programmatic interface, you that enables you to do some other things like chaining of one event. So if you have uh, completion events that are in two different systems, and you want one to be chained after and depend on the other, uh, you can support that as well. So we think that the system is general enough to support all that. Another key design aspect that we've gone after for this is um, essentially to make it so that Hi-Hat's dispatch layer doesn't need to know about and doesn't need to care about what the underlying implementations are. And none of that uh, target specificity is baked into uh, what it is that the dispatch code does. And uh, there are, uh, a further thing is that um, the uh, you know a design principle for hi hat is that everything is truly asynchronous and that you can queue up all of the stuff that you have to get done all of the actions um, long before anything else whatsoever has executed and uh, <clears throat> that you don't have to block on anything um, and that can be important if uh, you're trying to do things sort of in aggregate chunks uh, for, you know, being able to take a sequence or a batch or a graph or something that's of coarser granularity and get all of that in queued before you actually start doing any work. And so that you can essentially uh, enqueue it and then send it off for processing someplace else completely differently that's way far on the other side of the world and may take forever to respond. That's still okay. So one of the creative tensions around this is that if the synchronization objects are not themselves are not known to and uh, depended on and interacted with by the hi hat dispatch layer, then you want to be able to um, fire off when you enqueue something, uh, something that says, "Hey, uh, and when you get around to it, go create that synchronization object, which may be far away." and not have to sit and wait for it to be created in a synchronous fashion before you come back. 
Um, but then uh, you have the liability when you do that of, I've now got this, thing, this action handle, which has a member inside it, which is a synchronization object, and that is not yet populated. And so now when you go to ask the action handle, hey, you know, of all the synchronization, all the stuff you're doing and all the synchronization objects inside, there must be one of those that's post-dominating. And can I get that, please? And uh, you have to have some way of dealing with the fact that it may not yet have been created. And so um, uh, we are, uh, what Wojtek described is APIs wherein you can essentially go in uh, block on that if you wish, or you can ask it, hey, are you ready with that yet? And the answer can be, no, not yet, ask again later. And um, that adds, uh, you might call it a richness as a euphemism um, or a complexity, if, if you want to be more blunt about it, to the API to be able to offer those. Um, but the, the design goal that we were uh, seeking after was to be able to maximize the potential for true asynchrony um, and be able to deal with uh, asking the question of, you know, uh, or giving p implementations the freedom of asking, um, you know, the question of, are you done yet? And be able to get an answer of no, or say, give me this answer and I'll wait for it and uh, service that in a blocking fashion. So um, I think we wanted to, uh, one question to ask is, in this community with those gathered, uh, do we so strongly value uh, that opportunity, that principle of being able to do things asynchronously and you know having agents that are gonna do this on our behalf be arbitrarily far away that we really, really want to be able to support full asynchrony in everything without architecturally requiring blocking and give as a mitigation of that users the option of either uh, not bothering to pull and just sort of asking for it in a blocking fashion or uh, use another version of that that can go and uh, pull on it and wait for it to be read. So, you know, what, what is it that this community values uh, as you've looked at um, client systems that are built on top of this, how badly do you want that asynchronously, uh, synchronicity? And are you willing to pay for it with uh, a little bit of complexity of either blocking or pulling and uh, getting an answer that it's not done yet? Try not to all talk at once. <laughs> Does everybody understand the, the question and what's being laid out yeah. there? I know there's a lot of detail here. I mean, well, so, all right, so this is Andrew. I guess uh, the question about the question, I mean, are, are, is the concern just about additional, just having a larger interface, or is it going to, is, is um, there going to be an extra runtime cost, or is it just, or is that the interface <coughs> that you always use is always going to be more complex? <clears throat> yeah, I understand your question. Uh, I, I think that we are seeking where possible to have as few APIs as possible so that we can keep things as lean as possible. Um, it seemed to us to be to make a good trade off it, to be to choose architecturally to support full asynchrony if that's what was wanted or needed. Um, and that uh, we mitigated that, uh, you know, the, the complexity of, we, instead of forcing everybody, you must be able to deal with, it's not ready yet, um, that we would give people the option of a blocking call asking what the underlying synchronization object is if they really needed it, um, or uh, uh, give them the freedom if they really want to just 
ask and come back later uh, that they can do that too. So that is an increase in the number of APIs. Uh, we didn't see that as having, we haven't measured it, but we're not expecting that that's going to have any material performance cost. Okay. Well, I mean, so this, this, this question, of course, came up uh, in MPI, and you know, I apologize for you know being an old guy and and uh, saying, well, when we did it this way, um, but the you know MPI, a couple of options were discussed with dealing with that, but you know, as, as I think everyone knows, we ended up with all the interfaces, um, but the justification there was that even though there were a lot of the API was big, the actual concepts were not very big and they were just, you know, slightly different variations on some basic things to, you know, provide a uh, certain optimization, and, you know, for those cases. But, you know, in this case, another option is, so, you, you know, you have a, um, a non-blocking and you have a weight and you can always make a blocking thing yourself by combining uh, the non-blocking one is following it immediately with the weight, um, and that that was one, you know, option that was discussed in MPI for, for this kind of case. Or alternatively, you can have the blocking one and spawn another thread to wait on it. But I think for um, you know simplicity and 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 having a cleaner program on the user side, having different APIs available to do, you know. Ex express intent exactly uh, would, would be better. So I guess I prefer, you know, just speaking for myself, I prefer having, uh, you know, a rich API even, you know, even, but realizing that that really does reflect just a few basic concepts. Okay, thanks, very clear. Other positions on that? CJ, what are the what are the alternative approaches here? I mean, would you just would you just drop the the mechanism for blocking, or is there some is there some other approach to this would allow a less active sort of polling approach to this? Uh, I can answer that. Boy, tech, you want to jump in? Right. Yeah. Um, so w w when I first wrote this down, uh, I first wrote the, this API as a completely blocking one. And you can see that in the sample that I haven't updated. Uh, then we had a bit of brainstorming with CJ, and CJ had the position of, well, that doesn't go well with the existing concepts in hi-hat, that everything is asynchronous, so we should just make it, make it asynchronous. And we found some middle ground there to uh, have, you know, one API call that is uh, that, that uses a parameter to switch between the blocking and the non-blocking behavior. Um, so probably the answer to your question is, or alternative is, to present a completely non-blocking API that would simply fail if the synchronization object is not available, and then it would be up to the user to handle that case of whatever I need for my intimate dependencies does not really even exist yet. And uh, I have to do something about it. Uh, whereas this API that is on the screen right now would um, would block until something is, uh, until the civilization object is, is is available, I guess. So just presenting the, the asynchronous API would present a smaller interface as you know, uh, would the interface would be quite still versatile, and you can implement anything with it. Um, but at the expense of uh, everybody's, um, you know, everybody is forced to to handle that complexity of whatever I need may not even exist yet. Does that sound right, CJ? Yeah, perfect. So this this may. Um, I uh, this may just be a, a, a terminology or, a, or a, a, an understanding approach, but I'm, what I'm trying to understand is the way that you, you're describing it, it sounds like there are a series of uh, code blocks that are loaded that are on hold because they've run into uh, 
not necessarily blocking. They may well have been told, no, your data's not ready. And the, the execution pointer goes on somewhere else, but there's memory allocated and, and data that's held in memory uh, while it's waiting to hear back if, when, that, when that piece of data comes. Is, is, is that the case or is there some way in which we can make sure that, um, that, uh, that code blocks are small enough that, uh, that they only start to execute when we know that they can complete? Um, and the reason for that obviously is, um, you know, that we don't, we don't want to have, we don't want to fill up our memory space with um, with code that has that is in the process of executing but is unable to complete because data is not yet available, it would be better if, in some way, the code did not start to execute. That that, that there were chunks of code that did not start to execute. Is that is that an approach that is possible here, or um, or is uh, is it already is it already built into to hi hat, or is it is it more fundamental than that? Yeah, your question's very clear. The uh, the answer is that's that decision is left up to the pluggable implementations. So, uh, in in so far as, uh, but I'll add a little bit of nuance to that. In so far as things get enqueued, the things that you're passing around when you enqueue stuff are pointers. So here's a pointer to where the code is. Code hasn't been loaded necessarily, but the, you know, here's a pointer to where the code is or, or could be, right? Or here are a pointer to data operands. And as you're in the business of enqueuing things, you're passing around pointers as references. Um, and uh, there may be more work that yet needs to be done to like, you know, here's where the data is gonna show up once it gets moved, but it may not have been moved there, but I've given you, I've enqueued this series of actions that will tell you everything about what is supposed to happen in terms of the implications, in terms of moving data, in terms of memory allocations, and all those things that need to be done that are described in principle in a plan that has been submitted to quote unquote the system, but may not have been executed yet. So insofar as your desire to say, hey, can I hold off as long as I want to in terms of allocating memory, moving data, filling code, doing those kinds of things, the answer is yes. And then there's a question of, well, whose responsibility ultimately is it to do that and whose responsibility is it to decide when and where and how all that is to happen? And the answer is that's all ultimately left up to the underlying implementation, which is plugged in underneath hi-hat. So hi-hat in the spirit of being minimal doesn't decide those things for you. It leaves those up to the underlying implementations. Is that clear? It is clear. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. And I would think that that's what we want to do. Have, it does put more of the onus on the implementers of these but they can do you know, the natural things that they would normally do, and it doesn't, take, doesn't rest away from the user control by codifying something that the user doesn't necessarily want to into the hi-hat dispatch API, implementation. Thanks, that, that helps a lot. The, the, um, uh, when you talk about the implementer, you're still thinking that there is, um, you know, a layer in here like Raja that makes these these decisions. Or are you thinking when you say implement a, the application program, you're not you're not planning to use hi hat directly in the application, right? You're you're planning to to have a layer in here that does in fact make a lot of these decisions about um, about policy effectively. Is that is that correct? Yes. Um, so there's a that's true. I think you started to ask another question, which I think it's a, how much of that responsibility is shared above and below the hi-hat dispatch layer? Yes. The answer is that the expectation is that to a first order, the scheduling decisions which have to do with ordering and binding are made above hi-hat. And it is possible to have, to sort of spoon feed the underlying implementation of I'm not going to give you anything unless I already know that all the dependencies are satisfied and you are totally ready to go and I won't give it to you until that. And you can and should do it in exactly this order. 
that is something that you can do and put the full responsibility above the hi-hat uh, dispatch layer. You also have the flexibility of saying, as a scheduler, as a client above hi-hat, I'm gonna get it all pretty close, and then uh, I'll give you additional freedom to be able to make some decisions that, for example, might have been dealt with in hardware or a very, very low level engine about exactly how things should work and when all those micromanagement decisions could be happening. And I can defer those down into the underlying implementation level. And you have that freedom as well. So you have both freedoms. And you can, you, you as a user of the system, as a selector of the underlying implementations, and as a provider of the scheduling activity that happens above hi hat can make all those appropriate balances according to your wishes. Thank you, really, really helpful. I, I know we're about out of time. Let me see if I can sneak in a couple other comments. So one of the key things that we'd like to get some feedback on is there are, if there are cases where you really want something to be happen, be able to happen very remotely that can take arbitrarily long. It's helpful for any of those, uh, whether it's in arts or something else, that we have we flesh out those concrete use cases where it really is clear why we want it to be so darn asynchronous and want to be able to wait arbitrarily long and push all the work to happen in some very far away place. That's helpful to have. Um, also, just another high level comment. Um, uh, John, I think you said your microphone's not working. Um, I don't know, Mauro, if you want to speak to this. Um, do you want to mention the upcoming event we have in, in June here in uh, Zurich? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you're quiet, but we can hear you. Ah, I, I rejoined as a different name on the other computer, and I finally got the microphone and stuff working. Yeah, um, we've, sorry, I missed the first half of the talk, but um, we're having a, um, a workshop in, at CS, uh, CSCS in Zurich at the um, early June, and I said actually last month that we'd send out an invitation that we haven't done, but we should really move on with that. And we would like to get people who are interested in this together to talk about how we can best um, best design these APIs and, 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 and integrate them into runtimes so that we can really use them. Um, is that what you wanted to hear, um, CJ? Is, exactly. Yep. Is there something specific that you, you would like me to say? Because I uh, wasn't thinking about it until you said it. So. Yeah, I just I put in the notes, um, it's in Zurich, April 10th and 11th. Um, just I it's 11th, 11th I, and 12th, isn't it? Is I recorded there that you're hosting and um, you know, reach out to you, me, others if you're interested. Uh, I think we should probably post some places the, as we start to meet and hash out the details of the agenda. Uh, you know, For example, the, the layering for asynchronous tasking like D++ and HPX and maybe hi-hat and CUDA graphs or whatever else the underlying targets are uh, to be able to uh, you know, flesh that out so people can see. Yeah, um, in that case, we should talk after this meeting sometime, sometime this week and send out invitations uh, as soon as possible. All right. Good. Over time. Yeah, we should, uh, we should draw it to a close. Thanks, everybody. I will get the uh, audio posted um, before the end of the day so as those people who missed uh, parts of this can pick it up. And, um, and thanks. Uh, we can bring it to a close.